welcome back and today we are going to be talking about macroinvertebrates. Um, so the word itself can be broken down into two subparts. We have macro and invertebrate. Macro simply refers to the size. Um, so the creatures we're looking at today will be big enough to see without um, a microscope and then invertebrate refers to the fact that they don't have a backbone. So um, simply macroinvertebrates are creatures that don't have a backbone and can be seen without a microscope. Um, you typically can find macroinvertebrates in smaller bodies of water such as lakes, streams, stuff like that either in the sediments at the bottom or floating in the water. Um, some common examples we're going to be seeing today are snails, insects, and maybe some aquatic worms as well. Um, what is really cool about macroinvertebrates is that they are cold-blooded, which means they cannot regulate their body temperature like humans can, so they rely on the sun and the surrounding environment to do that process for them. Um, and also, some of ma the macroinvertebrates spend their entire lives in the water, while some, such as dragonflies, actually start off in the water as larvae and they will transition to land into their adult forms. So as Malia said um, earlier, macroinvertebrates live in dentritus, which is leaves or other material that has fallen to the bottom of riverbeds. Um, and that's really important for decomposers because they eat that and recycle nutrients back into the river. So today we're going to be using a D-net to help catch some creatures. Um, it has a metal frame that's a D-shape that helps us scoop the bottom of the river and it has a, you know, some mesh at the bottom, which helps keep the creatures inside, but the water to escape. So let's try to test and get some creatures. Oop. I have a couple creatures in there. Alright, so this is a water penny larvae, and this is the larval stage of the riffle beetle. They are found on every continent except for Antarctica. Typically, you can find them under rocks in an air's rapid currents, which helps provide protection from their predators, which are birds, rodents, and fish. Their diet consists of mainly algae and plants, and for them, it takes about one to two years for them to fully morph into their adulthood. So what we have here is a juvenile salamander. Um, they are very similar to tadpoles where they are born in the water and they actually hatch without any arms or legs. They are amphibians, which means double life in Greek, uh, which is due to them being born in the water and then transitioning onto land later in their life. They are born with gills and then they later develop lungs when they fully transition to land. This is a damselfly nymph and this is the juvenile of the damselfly. They are aquatic predators, meaning that they do eat other aquatic insects. Similar to crabs, they molt or shed their skin several times before they go through metamorphosis. Its long tail at the end actually contains gills, which is how they breed when they are submerged underwater. And a really cool fact about these creatures is that they have been around for over 300 million years. So this is a caddisfly larva. They are related to butterflies and moths. The larvae protect themselves from predators in this cocoon made of silk that they produce and other underwater materials that will help them be camouflaged. They tend to eat algae and are most active at night. So we caught some pond snails. There are two of them as you can see. Um, they can breathe through their skin, but they usually do breathe with their lungs. If their population sizes get too small, they can actually reproduce by themselves, which is really cool. Um, they have this layer of mucus that they use, which helps them travel right under the surface of the water. Usually they can get as big as three inches and they have these raspy tongues, which they use to help scrape algae and dead plants off of the surrounding rocks. Thank you for watching our video today. Because macroinvertebrates can withstand different conditions, they can really indicate how bodies of water are polluted or not. So in our next video, we'll be diving into the world of plankton. So tune in for next time. Thank you for watching.